Well, there's only two weeks left in the regular season of our preview of Michigan's football schedule. Today, it is the University of Maryland and a trip to College Park. My guest, Johnny Holiday, the voice of the Terrapins. We'll talk to him a little bit later in the podcast here on In the Trenches. Let's go In the Trenches with John Jansen. The former Wolverines captain and Michigan Sports Hall of Famer will take you inside the locker room with players and coaches. He can't wait to get going, and I think everybody's enthused about it. And uh, it's all a lot of preseason talk about this and that, what could be. But this will be, without question, his best team he's had at Merrill. Once again, here's John Jansen. Welcome back, friends. And I always like to remind you all of the content that is coming out here on MGO Blue Podcasts. And this week for Defend the Block, Brian Bush sat sat down with soon-to-be senior Emily Kaiser of the women's basketball team and Jerron Simmons, uh, the video analyst for men's basketball. So make sure you go back and you'll look at the MGO Blue Podcast with John Jansen, and that's where you will find Conquering Heroes, all of its old episodes, and that will come back in the fall here once students arrive back on campus. All of the preview editions that we have had on In the Trenches, as well as Defend the Block. That one is done by Brian Bush, obviously covering Michigan basketball. But Mr. Bush, how are you? How was the conversation with uh, with Emily Kaiser? Great. Uh, really big fan of her. That's kind of the recruiting class with Nas Hillman, with Amy Dilk, with Emily, with Daniel Rausch, who we caught up with uh, a few weeks back. That, that didn't necessarily start it, but... I think that was a pivot point. That was a step up. And obviously with what Nas has done leading the way, uh, that's where Michigan women's basketball really took that next step. And we saw it come to fruition back in March. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, obviously on the basketball side of things, both men's and women's, The both teams are really humming along in terms of what we saw from Jawan Howard this past year, full season. Didn't get a chance to see it, obviously, in 2020 because of the uh, uh, at least the end of the season. But uh, Kim barnes Rico, same thing on the women's side. Really excited, especially with some of those games in the tournament. My goodness, it was fun. And then that matchup with Baylor, well, I've I've actually gone back and watched that a couple of times, and it is, it's annoying because of the way it ended, um, and just you know the missed you know missed calls, missed opportunities. But that is that experience. I think will bode very well for this basketball team and the program. And then you you know you look at both sides, men's and women's. The recruiting has been outstanding. Yeah, it really has. And when you look at it broadly. I mean, we're not naive here. Certainly, you know this. You've experienced it. Michigan football is the most popular sport at this university. That's how it always has been and probably always will be. But it's been cool to see some of those maybe non-traditional sports that are getting the coverage. People were locked in on women's basketball in that NCAA tournament run. Women's gymnastics winning the national championship. Field hockey getting to the national championship game. Michigan's always had some great uh, non-quote-unquote you know revenue sports, right? But I think the popularity... And, and how many people are paying attention is really going up. It is, and it, it's going to be fun to watch those th- those two programs as they continue to develop and head towards excellence. But uh, uh, let's talk some more football because we got Maryland coming up uh, in this edition. Johnny Holiday, the play-by-play voice, is going to join me in just a little bit. But uh, let's get to our 7 from 77. Yeah, John, so – Media Day for the Big Ten is starting the day that this podcast is coming out on Thursday. John, you've been to Media Days. I think we all understand that there's not a whole lot of news-breaking, hard-hitting journalism in all of this. Tell me your experiences of this, and and what is it like for players who participate in this and, and get inundated for a couple of hours? Hey, tell me about you and this team. Well, it's it, I have a different perspective now, or at least I have a new perspective because I've seen it from the players' side, and that was twenty plus years ago now, and I've also seen it from the media side and having covered it for the past few years. So, from the media side, you love it when players come in with energy. Um, the fact that they want to talk about and and what you're going to hear from players right now is we've all had a great off season. Everybody's healthy. 
we're excited about the coaching staff, we're excited about changes that were made, and we're very hopeful for this coming season. That's generally what you're going to hear. From you know, sitting in that player's chair, what you're thinking is, this is the start of the football season. We haven't had practice, we haven't you know, put on pads, but this is the start of reality. And we didn't have media days last year. We didn't have a, you know, a, a typical football season or the start of a season. The, ki- the, the players that are going to be at media days from across the Big Ten, and you know, you've already seen it down at the SEC, ACC, they're all going to have their media days. This is a very exciting time. One, you get picked by your coach to represent your team. And you've you you know you've accomplished that by doing what you're supposed to do. You're good in school. You you know you you've been good on the field. You've worked hard. This is kind of the payoff for that. Um, and all see all off season, you've been focused on you know for Michigan, Western Michigan, um, you know Washington, NIU, the Big Ten schedule. But this is where you get a chance to talk a little bit about yourself a lot about your team, your teammates, and your expectations. And every once in a while, you do hear some very honest answers by these kids. And that's where, you know, th- that's where you understand that these aren't trained professionals. Uh, and and they, they will say some things that if you, you know, have bad intentions, you can twist them and, and make it, you know, sound controversial. But quite honestly, you want to get as many of those honest answers as you can because this football season is going to be real. It's going to feel real. It's going to be real. It's going to look real. And no better way to start it off. The unique thing about it is it's not in Chicago this year. It's down in Indianapolis, which I'm not a big fan of. But, hey, they're having them. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, number two, I'm, I'm largely in agreement with the concepts of Media Day and what you get out of this. It's a lot of positivity. Everybody's optimistic. If you're in this and it's July 20th and you're feeling downtrodden, boy, things didn't go well over the last eight months during the offseason. So let's talk about the three players. There'll be plenty of stories out in the coming days about what these three young men say. Let's talk about them and what you expect and what you think about what their role can be. We start... Aiden Hutchinson. Just how vital is his role, not just as one of this team's main talkers, but also in the locker room, that leadership role of being a vocal person when the cameras and the microphones are not there? Well, he's in his entire life, he's heard about, you know, Big Ten championships. He's heard about the standard at Michigan, the expectations at Michigan. And he has yet to be able to experience them for himself. Now, individually, he's played extremely well. And it now it's a matter of for Aiden Hutchinson, what does he have to do as a leader on this team to get guys to play at an extremely high level? And when we talked to him earlier in the year, it was about getting with Ben Herbert and the strength and conditioning staff and making sure that they wring every single ounce of energy and ability out of him. When you go in there as a star player, that is your mindset. And you show that. You don't just talk about it, but you show that. Now, the last guy on the roster, the the you know whoever thinks that they're you know down the, the the depth chart, they see those guys doing it. Hey, if I want a chance to get in the rotation, if I want a chance to get on the field, I'm going to have to do that and maybe more. So it sets a standard for what all the other players are supposed to do. You have to have your superstars be your hardest workers and do it by example. Number three, the other defensive representative for Michigan and Indy, Josh Ross. Uh, Of course, a a very interesting journey on the field to this point. An injury, some role changes. Last year, he was this team's leading tackler. What are you most intrigued by when it comes to him and his role, not just on the field, but now you would assume is a leadership type role, not just in the linebacker room, but probably in the defense. Yeah, on the defense and really the whole team. Uh, Again, it's about... The juniors and seniors on this team are the ones that have to lead. They're the ones that have to go out there and set the standard. And that's the way it's always been at Michigan. When Michigan has been successful, that leadership has come from junior seniors. It doesn't mean that you can't have a freshman or a sophomore throughout the course of the season show that they're, they can be leaders as well. But you've been here. You know how it's supposed to be done. And Josh Ross... 
throughout the trials and tribulations of his career, some ups, some downs, some you know injuries that you have to come back from, he's earned the ability to say, I've been through all of these different things. I'm still here, and I want to win as just as bad as anybody else, probably more because the clock is ticking. And he's going to demand from those younger guys, hey, that's – if, if Ben Herbert, if they're run, doing a running drill and he says hand on the line, it's not an inch in front of the line. It's not an inch behind the line. There's an exact place it's supposed to be. And a lot of times, you know, when seniors start to, to hold everybody to that standard, there can be some pushback. How you operate as a senior, as a leader on this team, and how you handle those situations will very much determine the success of this team. Number four, the lone offensive representative heading to media day, Hassan Haskins. It feels like this is the first stretch where we all know that he is a top of the list, not just producer or at least potential producer and and, and his role, but also as a potential leader, especially considering the inexperience that Michigan has at quarterback, where there's always going to be a leadership role in that, especially for the starter. Where does Haskins set in in terms of helping to set the tone for this offense leadership-wise? Well, when you're talking about the offense, you've got to be able to have an offensive line that is uh, you know, communicating well. They find a, a great relationship with each other. They work together well. And the guy that is behind them watching all of this happen and is a direct beneficiary of that is the running back and the quarterback and how he sees things, how he communicates in the huddle. The running back can be a great individual to be in the ear of the offensive lineman, to be in the ear of the quarterback, to be talking to Josh Gaddis when they come to the sidelines because they have such a great view of everything that's going on. And not just of what's happening on the offense, but also what do you see on defense? What is that defense doing to counter how we line up in a formation? And Hassan has the experience of being on the field. He should have the knowledge of this offense, having now been in it for three years, that all of that should be able to come from him. And it's when you have that type of communication and a guy that can express that, you, you, that in and of itself can be a leadership role as well. Number five, I know we kind of both talked about media day, and, and I know I don't look at it as this gold mine of reporting. This is an opportunity to talk to these players, these coaches, uh, but th- this is a lot of flowery stuff. I, I do think there is plenty to gather from this, though. I don't want to say that there's not. Once you kind of filter out the typical coach speak and optimism and stuff like that, who are some of the players or coaches that you are maybe monitoring a bit more closely? I'll give you my three. Okay. Uh, I've got two head coaches. I'm, I'm really fascinated about Brett Bielema. I think that was a great hire for Illinois. Uh, he's obviously had a proven model here. I think he's a pretty interesting talker. Uh, I'm curious how he'll set the tone. Also, Greg Schiano of Rutgers. He has been pretty upfront. He's been aggressive. Uh, you can't go into certain recruit conversations, but his recruiting is up. There's no doubt. And on the on the football side, Michael Penix Jr., Indiana, I think he is somebody who can – shift the power of the East division based on his health. He Indiana has been improved in every area, but a quarterback elevates you. I'm curious how he'll speak about the injury situation, where he's at at this point. I don't know if he'll say anything definitively, but I'm going to be listening. Those are my three. Um, so for me, in terms of the coaches, um, you know, Ryan Day, uh, obviously with my focus and everybody's focus around here should be on Ohio State. And this is, yes, when he took over as head coach, he had to take Justin Fields, who was going to be a new quarterback. You know, uh, Dwayne Haskins was moving on to the NFL. But this feels like the first time where he's going to have to sort through his quarterbacks. And whether it's C.J. Stroud, it's Jack Miller, it's the incoming freshman – He's going to have to sort through who is the best guy to have out there, and then, you know, how is it going to go? How do I develop that quarterback? How do I how do I bring out the leadership skills in young individuals? And not that he didn't have to do it with Justin Fields, but it felt more like Justin Fields came a little bit more prepared coming from Georgia and being the high recruit that he was. Now, he still continued to develop him and got great, you know, production out of him. But I, I want to, I want to, I'm looking at him to see what he says about the quarterback, what he talks about in regards to the offense, because you've got, you know, 
terrific receivers. You've got a lot, you know, skilled players all around you. What are you going to hear from him in terms of, you know, getting this team to gel? Um, I think the other one, that, and the one that I always listen to is Pat Fitzgerald. Yeah. I think, you know, being the guy that's been around the Big Ten as a player, as a coach, and what he's done at Northwestern, there's just so much that you can learn from him on a, you know, yearly basis when you get a chance to to see what's going on in terms of the Big Ten West. As far as a player, I'm looking at what Penn State is is going to be talking about, what their conversation is like. Because like Michigan, they didn't have a season that they had expected last year. They started out 0-5. I, we know about the the heartbreaking loss they had to Indiana to start the season. And you mentioned Michael Penix. Uh, it seems like Sean Clifford is the leader in the clubhouse to be the starting quarterback there. But... Tariq Castro Fields, Jahan Dotson, and PJ Mustafer are going to be the representatives that Penn State is sending. And for Jahan Dotson, who is a big play threat, it 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 makes a big difference that he has a good relationship with that quarterback. And I'm going to be listening to him in regards to when they ask him about Sean Clifford or they ask him about anybody else on the roster, how does he respond? How does he react? What does he say about some of those players? Uh, I think will be very telling as to what Penn, what direction Penn State is looking at uh, going into 2021. All right. Number six on today's seven from 77, we transition to our game-by-game preview topic this week, and that is Maryland. Uh, first, looking back to last year, they may have had their momentum disrupted by COVID more than any other Big Ten program. Started 2-1 and one after opening by getting housed at Northwestern. Then they beat Minnesota at home in a good game, and then won at Penn State. Then a COVID outbreak in their program, costing them games against Ohio State and Michigan State both to be at home. Finished with a loss at Indiana. Then the canceled game against Michigan when the Wolverines were on their outbreak. And then an OT loss at home to Rutgers. What, if anything, John, can you glean from last year? Because there were some nice wins. There were some blowout losses. I, I feel like it is tough, though, based on how herky-jerky the schedule was. Well, for Maryland, it was all about experience. Uh, you know, it was experience for uh, Talia, their their quarterback, Tunga Bailoa, and just getting him out there, getting those game reps at game speed. And, uh, you know, the receivers, Rakeem Jarrett had – you know, five games where he was able to get out there and perform. And Dante uh, Demas, uh, the other wide receiver, it's about for for them and where their program is. I don't think anybody was picking them to win the Big Ten East sure, last year. Sure. They weren't in that position. I don't even think if you asked, uh, you know, Mike Loxley, and he was 100% honest, he's not going to say we weren't in a position to compete for a championship. But during a COVID year, they wanted every opportunity they could get to get out there and it's one thing to practice and it's and there's a practice speed but it's another thing to be able to get out there with some young guys and not have the pressure of the crowd not have the pre- you know the noise of the crowd they could communicate they're going to take what they learned on the field in game speed and be able to use that to hopefully springboard themselves into more in 2021 you alluded to Mike Loxley number 7 I feel like there's some momentum there. The recruiting has seemed to increase and enhance under him. It's year three, technically, even though he's had, what, 20 games, a little bit less now as the head coach at Maryland. Are they ready to make some noise in what will be one of the toughest divisions in the big or in college football in the Big Ten East? I, I think they're ready to make some noise in regards to they're going to beat somebody of significance sure. in the Big Ten East, and they're they're a force to be reckoned with. On it. you, you have to be aware of them, like Rutgers under Greg Schiano. Do I believe that that Maryland or Rutgers are going to win the Big Ten East? Not in the least. I'm not. Gonna, I would never make that prediction, but I do believe they are in a position where they're good enough to be really dangerous. And both Greg Schiano and Mike Loxley have done a great job of recruiting within their region. And when I get a chance to talk to Johnny Holiday without spoiling too much, he does point out the fact that they have 11 players from the state of Maryland in this recruiting class. And I lived there for a decade. I know the talent that comes out of that DMV area. And if you can attract a lot of that talent and, you know, you, you all of a sudden it's, hey, it's Rakeem Jarrett. Jarrett. 
And then all of a sudden, it's the next guy from his high school, or it's a couple more guys. Hey, if they made that decision, let me take a look. They've got a new facility. It just kind of starts to snowball. And I think Mike Loxley is in that position right now where they're starting to generate some good feelings there in Maryland. And they just need that one or two signature wins. And all all of a sudden, they're going to be a, a, a force to be reckoned with. Michigan basketball fans know about the DMV area very, very well. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Hunter Dickinson voice. Maybe they should recruit over at DeMath a little bit more. Anyways, we transition. Uh, John, the man who was credited with creating the first statutes, the first, in essence, laws in Maryland way back in the mid-1700s, his name was Thomas Bacon. Now, uh, Mr. Bacon did not really age very well in what he did and how he his belief system as the decades and centuries have gone on, but... Uh, apparently, the Maryland Bacon Festival that was created a little bit less than a decade ago kind of sucked, so I didn't have much to go with in Maryland on bacon, uh, <laughs> edible stuff, so yes. sorry. Um, just the fact that you found somebody, and the, the gentleman that created the first statutes in the state of Maryland with the name of Bacon... I. My hat is off to you. We've been doing this. How many episodes are we at now? <laughs> Too many. It, you, like, uh, it is amazing. Like now I'll, I'll type into my my Google, just be B, and it'll just be like bacon, bacon facts, <laughs> rare bacon items, yes. buy bacon now. Like, yeah, it's not great. Uh, so my hat's off to you uh, for, for always finding something, uh, whether it's actual bacon or just the name <laughs> bacon uh, in regards to this. But a guy that's been doing this a long time, and by this I mean calling – the Maryland Terrapins football games. Johnny Holiday gets a chance to stop by and give his perspective on what his expectations are for this coming football season, his expectations for Mike Loxley and what he has seen different from when Lox was there the first time and where this program is headed. I hope everybody enjoys the conversation I have of the preview of the Maryland Terrapins with Johnny Holiday. I am pleased to be joined by the voice of the Maryland Terrapins from the Maryland Terrapin Radio Network, Johnny Holiday. He's been doing this a long time. I had a chance to get to know him there in the D.C. area when I was there with the Washington football team. Johnny, thanks for joining us. And how excited are you for this football season and the prospect that it could be back to 2019 where we get a chance to talk to the coaches in person, players in person, see practice, be at games? I cannot, I cannot tell you, John, how excited I am. It, it's, it's like Christmas time and Christmas morning when you open up all those presents. Uh, I keep just keeping my fingers crossed that, as you said, things will be back to normal like it was a couple of years ago. Because last year, for all of us, I'm sure you guys included doing the Michigan game, it's very, very difficult to do what we had to do. But everybody was in the same boat, and we all got, th- uh, got through it. But I think this is the most excited that I think Maryland fans have been since the days of Ralph Friedgen when he won 75 games in in his 10 years of coaching at at Maryland. Uh, Mike Loxley's third year, he's got a lot of kids coming back. He he lost some key players, as every school does each year. But the optimism is so high. He's got a whole bunch of new coaches. Five new guys have joined the staff. And uh, he can't wait to get going. He had wonderful uh, commitments for the uh, for kids coming to Maryland. And I think it was ranked number 13 or 14 in the country on National Signing Day. And he's he's, he's ready to go. He, he's, a, he's a terrific coach. Uh, he's only been here, this is his third year as the head coach, but he was here a couple of years uh, in the past, uh, a couple of times. So he can't wait to get going. And uh, I think everybody's enthused about it. And uh, it's all a lot of preseason talk about this and that, what could be. But this will be, without question, his best team he's had at Maryland. Well, and you mentioned, obviously, Mike Loxley is going into his, you know, he's been there for three years. And the we, we've seen it with Greg Schiano. He's only been at, at Rutgers for two years. But they talk about building a fence around their recruiting grounds. For Greg Schiano, it's the state of New Jersey. For Mike Loxley, it's the DMV area and a very talent-rich area. How have you seen under his tenure the recruiting change, the commitments change, and the, just the conversation in the local communities of those local kids going to the University of Maryland? 
Well, the one thing, John, he, he's always emphasized since he came and took over the head coaching job in Maryland is the fact that he's, he said there's a lot of talent in the Washington, Baltimore area, in the state of Maryland, the state of Virginia. He wants to keep these kids at home. He wants them to play before their own families and their own friends. He said there's no need for people to have to go to other states to recruit because it's such a great talent base right here in Washington. He's got 11 kids coming in from the state of Maryland, got a couple of kids coming in from D.C., and, and that's it's, it's been his best recruiting class ever. But I think the thing he really sells is when you come to Maryland, they've got a brand-new facility here that will blow these kids away. It's the new Daryl Hill and Billy Jones team house, which was the old coal field house. It's been renovated. They've got four floors, strictly football, indoor practice facility, outdoor practice facility. When a recruit sees this, they're going to say, why should I go anywhere else? This is where I want to come to play football. And Mike tells every single kid coming in, you show me what you can do. I don't care if you're going to be a freshman or not. If you can play, you will play at my university. It's open, it's open school for everybody to show what they've got. He said, I don't care what kids have done in the past. That's in the past. You've got to show me right now. And the kids really locked on the mic. And he picked up some, some local kids. Uh, for example, this kid coming in from uh, Gaithersburg at Quince Orchard High School is a linebacker. This kid named uh, Damian Robinson. He'll be one of the keys, I think, defensively for Maryland. Brandon Jennings, a kid from down in Jacksonville, Florida, number seven ranked outside linebacker in the country. So he's got some real good freshmen coming in, but he's got a lot of veterans also coming back. Well, and you mentioned veterans coming back because nobody lost that year of eligibility. So some of these guys that are coming in as seniors were fifth year last year, they're sixth year this year. And as I look at the roster – you know, on defense, you mentioned those linebackers that are coming in as recruits. That seems to be the only place where they don't have as much experience as they do up front or as they do on the back end. Those young guys that you just mentioned, how much of an impact do you think they'll be this coming football season? Well, of the seven linebackers coming back, uh, John, you got a sophomore, McCullough. He's coming back. Burgess was a freshman. Andrews was a sophomore. Kobe Thomas is going to be a junior. Ruben Hippolyte is, is the key, I think, among all the linebackers. He's outstanding. He was only a freshman last year. You got no, uh, Fanage Noke, uh, Gote, you got David Brownlee. Uh, you lost a tremendous kid in Chance Campbell. Allende Ely will be the key, I think, among the linebackers there. But that would probably be, I think, maybe the shot for the young kids to get in there and get some playing time. Because up front, you got veterans coming back in the secondary is extremely strong, but all three or four of those guys, uh, returning lettermen, are coming, returning starters are coming back as well. So the linebacker core, if you're a good young freshman, and if you can show these next four or five weeks to six weeks before that first game against West Virginia, show what you can do, you may be getting some playing time. When you look at this defense, because, I mean, let's face it, the key to – uh, you know, winning football games now is one, you got to protect your quarterback and he needs to be able to make plays, whether it's with his feet or, or through the air. Defensively, it's about getting after that quarterback. How does this team generate pressure on opposing quarterbacks? Good question. They couldn't do it last year the way that Loxley wanted them to do it. But I think they got enough firepower coming back that Rodgers is outstanding at, at the Jack linebacker spot. Uh, Messiah Nasili Kite, the Defensive tackle, he's coming back. He was tied for the sacks lead last year. Amy Fanau, a second team all conference, he's back again. He's going to be a senior. Uh, Joseph Bola Capelli, an outside line defensive end, is coming back. So I think all those guys are going to be really factors in, in the defense. In the secondary, John, the guys you got to really look out for freshman All American at the left corner spot, Tar Heap Still, uh, 6'1, 180 from down in Upper New Jersey. He had a tremendous freshman year. He's preseason all-conference this year. Nick Cross, another preseason all-conference kid, will be one of the safeties. He and Mosley were outstanding last year. And Deontay Banks is coming back. So they got all those guys who had a lot of playing time last year. But I think to get pressure on, on the quarterback, you got to get some outstanding work from the Silly Kite and Amy Fanau and uh, Bola Tapelli and, and also uh, Latrez Rogers. 
Well, I I don't want to jump to shark too much, but you, we're talking about quarterback play and getting after the quarterback. Let's go over to the offensive side of things, and we all know that uh, Talia Tungavailoa is is a quarterback there in College Park. What are your expectations for him, and what does it mean to have a guy that is very familiar with Mike Loxley with his offense leading this the, the offense there in College Park? Well, the interesting thing about Talia last year, he threw for over 1,000 yards. He had seven touchdowns in only four games. He led the conference. He, I think he averaged close to 100, uh, 14 yards of completion. He was second in passing efficiency, and I think he was third in passing yards, almost 255 yards a game. The nice thing about him coming in this year, he's more comfortable with the offense. He worked with Loxley when Loxley was at Alabama. Of course, Mike coached his brother and I with the Miami Dolphins. And he's had a whole year to have, not a whole year, he had five games to get the system under his belt. So you know he's going to be much more familiar and much more comfortable with the offense. A lot of people already think this kid's going to be all conference this year. He's been named to the Maxwell Award list earlier this week. And he is a terrific, terrific kid. It's in, in his mind, it's not what he does, it's what the team does. It's everything team-oriented. And he always talks about, yeah, I'm a, I, the quarterback is the key, but we've got a lot of other guys that can do the job. I'm just part of the puzzle. And that's the thing I like about him. I think, as you mentioned, you got to have a good leader. And Mike Loxley said, I want that quarterback to be hitched to my belt 24 hours a day. I want this guy to be on the same page. With, I want him to have that winning attitude and that you know never-say-die attitude every time he goes out there in the field. And Talia is exciting to watch. Uh, Trying to think of how many touchdowns. I think he had three touchdowns rushing last year. Uh, He threw for seven touchdowns. Had a tremendous game against Penn State. An even better game against Minnesota. And this kid, I think the sky's the limit for him. He's going to be a junior. And not a big kid. He's only about 5'10", 5'11", about 200 pounds. But this is his team. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how if he can stay injury-free. He missed that last game of the year. Last year, Eric Najarian had to come in, a kid that had never played before, and did a pretty good job in that one game. But if Talia can stay healthy, that's going to be the key. Well, and he's going to have some great weapons to throw the ball to because the three starting receivers are back. Obviously, Rakeem Jarrett it was the headliner in you know a couple of years ago in the recruiting class, um, having chosen Mike Loxley and the Maryland Terrapins over schools like LSU that uh, a lot of people anticipated he was going to pick. Tell us a little bit more about the the talents of this wide receiving group as well as maybe some of the depth that you have there at wide receiver. They've got, they've got, we've got 10 guys coming back, John, 10 receivers from last year that all played and all contributed. You mentioned Jarrett. The key is Dante Demas. This kid was all conference, the number one receiver last year on this team. He had uh, five touchdowns for the season and five games. He caught a, he's caught a touchdown pass in 18 consecutive games. He had a couple of hundred yard games last year. One was Indiana. One was Minnesota. And then Brian Cobbs. You throw Cobbs in there with Dante Demas and with Jarrett. And Cobbs had a tremendous year last year. Then you got Dino Tomlin, Mike Tomlin's son, the Steelers head coach. You got Dewan Ellis. You got Jay Sean Jones, who got banged up a little bit, but he's back at 100%. You got Dejon McDougal. You got DeGenardo. You got Daryl Jones. You got Carlos Carrier. You got all these guys coming back. So if there's a strength to this team outside of your quarterback, it would be the wide receiver core. Well, and, you know, it, everything in football now is about the explosive play, about getting downfield. And if you've got great depth, you've got great speed at that wide receiver position, you're you're obviously have a huge advantage in the game. But you, you right. also have to, at some point, one, be able to protect the quarterback and run the football what when you look at this offensive line, what do you see? And then in the backfield as well, what are, who are the threats in the backfield uh, to gain yardage on the ground? Well, I think as a running back, Keon Slate Davis only played the one game last year. He had some uh, problems off the field, but he did come in to play the last game that they played. So he's coming back, an outstanding running back. He's he was a senior, but he's got one more year, and he's going to stay at Maryland. They lost a tremendous kid in Jake Funk, who went to the NFL. 
Uh, Jake was uh, one of Maryland's all-time leading rushers, leading rusher last year, battled back from injury after injury. He will be sorely, sorely missed. But Teddy Boone, a young freshman from Detroit, a uh, little bowling ball kid, 6'1", 245, he's in the mix. But Teon Fleet Davis is going to be the key, and that's a wide-open spot for some of these freshmen to step in and, and, uh, and contribute and contribute right away. Up front, the Terps lost Johnny Jordan, their starting center. He's gone. Marcus Miner decided to transfer in the portal to Pittsburgh, the starting right guard. He's gone. But everybody else is veterans. They're coming back. Jalen Duncan at left tackle, Jahari Branch at left guard. you got Evan Gregory moving up to that right guard spot. He played a lot behind Miner when, when Marcus got banged up last year. Austin Fontaine at left guard provides depth. Mason Lunsford, a, a sophomore from Albany, Maryland, a big kid at 6'6", 310-pound center. He'll move up to that starting spot. And then Spencer Anderson on the right side of the line at right tackle uh, will get that right tackle starting spot. So the offensive line, uh, which did not have such a lot of good pass protection last year, they allowed a lot of sacks. They gave up something like 13 or 14 on the year. Uh, but they should be much, much better this year. But the running game, they got to get some kind of a running game going. And I don't know who they're going to have to depend upon outside of Teon Fleet Davis and Penny Boone uh, to get some playing time. Well, last year, you know, records aside for everybody, it was an opportunity to get a lot of guys' experience. And yeah. when – when you look even back to Mike Loxley's first year and all of our eyes were opened when, you know, he, he pounded Howard, which you could say, okay, it's Howard. That's kind of anticipated and expected. Yeah. But then it was a ranked Syracuse team. And then there was Temple, which, it, you know, that game was, you know, could have gone either way. Is this team this year under, you know, Mike Loxley and having recruited more, is it closer to what we saw against, you know, Syracuse and Howard, um, then, you know, and having that, you know, continued sustained success than we've seen in some time at Maryland? John, I think, I think it's going to be better. I think much, much better. I think the schedule, uh, the schedule is, is more favorable this year. West Virginia, they open up with, that's going to be a tough one. Then you got Howard, you got your first two games at home. Then you go to Illinois and you got two more home games, Kent State and Iowa. Then a couple of tough ones at Ohio State, at Minnesota. You come back against Indiana, against Penn State, who they beat in State College last year. You play them home in College Park this season. Then they go to Michigan State. They come back and play Michigan here, and they end up playing Rutgers on the road. So you got seven home games coming up this year, and the first four out of the first five are home games. So they could, if they can get off to a good start, and of course the West Virginia game is going to be tough, as the Iowa game will be tough as well. Uh, they're going to, they're going to be in good shape, but I think this team is much much better than what we saw a couple of years ago. I've got Johnny Holiday today uh, from the Maryland Maryland Terrapin Network. Been calling play by play for Maryland football for some time, and and Johnny, I want to say thank you for your time, and I can't wait to get to College Park November. There are very few places that are just unique individual places in the month of November to be able to play college football that are as special as, as College Park. I think it's a hidden gem. I can't wait to get there, see you, and uh, and hopefully we're all in person. We can shake hands. We can high-five. We can do everything that we did prior to this pandemic, and I look forward to uh, to seeing you again soon. John, thank you very much. It's always good to be with you, and I have so many great memories of when you were here with the Washington Redskins. The fans will never forget what you did for this football team, this football organization. Well, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks, John. Well, as always, I want to thank Mr. Holiday for his time. It's always uh, valuable before the season gets started uh, because once it gets up and going, we're all going to be extremely busy, and that's what we are so excited about. August the 6th is when Michigan will start practice. When we get there, we will continue to bring you 
some of the players, some of the coaches in regards to what they're doing during training camp. Uh, And as always, Brian and I will give you our thoughts on what we see out on the field. If you missed any of the previews, we've got one more to go next week. It will be the game with Ohio State. But if you've missed any of them, you can always go back to MGO Blue Podcast and download them. Please like, subscribe, and leave us any comments, things you might be interested in hearing during training camp, during the start of the football season. Leave us those. We'll make sure we get to them. If you missed MGO Blue Podcast this week, it is upcoming senior Emily Kaiser of women's basketball and Jerron Simmons, who is the video analyst for men's basketball. Make sure you go back, take a listen to that as well. And we will talk to you next week. When my guest, Paul Keels, is going to stop by to talk about those dirty dogs down in Columbus, that is the Ohio State Buckeyes, here on In the Trenches. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of In the Trenches with John Jansen, part of our Michigan Athletics Podcast Network, M Go Blue Podcasts. The preceding has been a Learfield presentation of the Michigan Sports Network.